All right, hi world, welcome back with another video. And um, this video I'm gonna chill a lot more. I'm still learning how to present myself. And I think this is something I'm learning about my life in general, but I'm someone who constantly feels like I need to be doing more to like, more than what's necessary to like make up for my so-called shortcomings. But it really is this kind of made up thing I have and this that this idea that I even have shortcomings to begin with, here not to say that I'm expert at everything, no, but I am here to say that a lot of my shortcomings are not even realistic. And so we're kind of just like learning how to like just stop listening to all that noise because then it starts interfering with my expectations with life and then I end up having these like preordained outcomes that have yet to even occur based off of a false presumption of who I am or what I am or my abilities and so on. So I need to learn how to like take a take a relax, but like at the same time, I'm not saying be lazy, I'm not saying procrastinate, I'm not saying avoid the difficult work. No, I'm just simply saying just know when you can, you know, uh, kick back and realize that now sometimes the best work is done best when it's not always just like super intense, super intense all the time. No, I got to learn how to like lower my own expectations a little bit, especially with like what my even my own audience even expects of me. And so we're working on that. But, you know, I, I am here to say that I can confidently describe myself as a, as a historian, a military historian at that. I can also confidently say I'm someone who does not learn school in a linear way. Okay. And, and so... You know, I think I think had I done undergrad in, in a history major, I probably would have kicked ass. I would have gotten a lot of really good A's in my essays, and I would have had the time of day to read a lot of history books. But instead, I chose an engineering track, and I struggled a lot through the math um, and, and just struggled a lot through, through reading those engineering books when I could have had a much easier time in college. But instead, I chose um, a hard degree, hard major, and I'm still learning that um what i am what are my strengths and weaknesses and all that stuff so so we're still learning i'm still looking for that so-called successful career if you will and i and right now i may be a point at a point where i'm like you know what i'm actually just going to start creating the stuff that i care about um i'll put it up put it on youtube make products with it go with that and that will be my income but i still have much to learn even on that endeavor um, so in the meantime, we're just going to play this game, this game I do understand. Uh, there was a point in time where I didn't know how to play this game, but now I do. And I would say I'm an expert at the game. And for anyone who wants to play with me, just send me a message and I'll set up a game. We can set up the Discord and play with one another. But basically, this is part two of our video. And we're continuing off. We did the Soviet and the British setup for our 1941 scenario. We're now going to switch over to the Axis setup, or really namely the German setup and the corresponding allies. And then we're going to start that scenario, and I'm pretty excited. And, and then I think we'll go ahead and start the scenario um, probably in this video, I would think, uh, or maybe the next video. I probably, we'll see. I'm not sure. I'll, I'll keep it guessing just to entertain myself. But I will make one, one adjustment, which is that I have this 27th Army here located in Kalinin. And in fact, it actually should be located closer to the front. And so that's the only thing I'm going to change um, in the scenario. I think I'm going to put it, uh, we'll just put it right here um, across the river. And there we go. And it's, it, was a, it was a level two strength. Okay. And so, yeah, I learned, I learned that there was a discrepancy between the uh, 1941 Euro front scenario and 1941 East front scenario. And the discrepancy is that in the Euro front scenario, You've got the 50th Army located at Kalinin, but in the East Front scenario, you have the 50th Army located at Riga. And so I think there may have been a typo. Probably it was a typo, but I have reason to believe the 27th Army should be the one near Riga, and the 50th Army would be some sort of reserve, part of the, of the, the uh, I guess just a regular reserve. Uh, I think they called it the uh, Front of Reserve Armies, and it essentially was... The, you know, the fact that there was a little bit of military presence all over Russia, just all evenly distributed because it was part of the reserve system. So anyways, um, that's the only change I'm doing for the Soviet side. I think everything else is in pretty good order. 
Um, unless there was any other changes I wanted to make, I don't think so. And so with that, we're now going to switch over to the axis side. And there we go. Should be able to unhide these units. We can. Excellent. And I just want to go back, make sure I can go back to the Soviet side. Okay, good. I got my... And all I'm doing, by the way, I'm just adding a letter there to like change my username technically by changing the password, and then that's that's that. So there we go. Um, we have Soviets, we have British set up. You know, they have them set up all over the Mediterranean in North Africa, especially large. It's always interesting to see a, a faction from the other perspective. You know, when when setting up the British, I was like, oh my gosh, the British are very sh a weak. There's not enough units. And now I look at it and I'm like, you know what? There's actually this half a dozen units in Egypt uh, actually look pretty impressive. And and playing as the Axis, I'm like, man, how am I gonna how am I gonna defeat that? So that's pretty interesting. And then of course the Soviets here. Um, I actually still don't think the Soviets are actually all that impressive right now, namely because their front lines are just so diluted. You know, if you want to have a good Soviet, I've played this game enough to know that you want to have like at least two to three hexes stacked up with units, or rather two to three units stacked up per hex in order to really be able to stop an effective German blitz. And right now, the only area that I'm seeing that the Soviets have double stacked is like a couple a couple hexes at the front. And I'll tell you now, it's just not enough. It's just not enough to stop a German blitz. Uh, it might, it might still be able to, but chances are it's going to be really hard. So I say that uh, already with some hindsight, and I'm just not that impressed by the... Uh, by the uh, the Soviet setup, if you ask me, frankly, and the truth is, the Soviets could have done a lot to change their setup significantly. They really could have. That was probably the greatest blunder that Stalin did in the whole war, was uh, not actually having his army mobilized or or or, or yeah, really just full mobilized uh, prior to the German invasion, and they and they could have, um, despite all the diplomatic efforts to maintain peace. Stalin could have actually done a bit more to basically ensure that the Axis, basically ensure that his army actually was ready to stop an Axis attack. It's one thing to bluff, you know, the enemy. It's another thing to actually have your forces strong enough to, to repulse, and the Soviet army was just far from ready. And, and I think Stalin knew that. I think everybody in the Soviet high command knew that. Because, I mean, you had the, 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 the Red Army uh, purge, which, which, by the way, just simply purged the, uh, it, it didn't purge the, uh, the entire Soviet army. It actually just purged the Soviet um, high command. The Soviet officer corps is really what it was targeted against. And any other major uh, either industrial or political rival that was within the Soviet Union, within that, that regime that would have been a threat to Stalin's immediate, uh, you know, office of power, basically. And so it was an, in an internal affair within the Soviet. This, this is an oversimplification. I still don't know the full story. But they essentially, uh, the Soviet regime basically uh, did a little bit of an audit on itself and basically decided that the extra, um, the, 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 anybody who would have been uh, seen as a potential hazard in the long term was basically seen as a liability. And those liabilities were deleted basically and, and that's literally what they did they just executed uh kangaroo court style you know um the trials did not make sense um, but they uh, basically at least twenty thousand people were executed with a stalin signature i know that much and i think he did, he had more than one signature but i think altogether he had about a give or take about a million people within either the soviet administration or the soviet army the soviet army being the red army being the the last major like threat to the to the to the Stalin's uh, rule and power, you know, uh, there's always the threat of a coup d'état, and he basically neutralized all of the generals that would have been uh, that would have possibly led such a coup d'état through through just reputation, and they're like, you know, just the, the the authority that they had you know, amongst the community, I guess, and so there's a lot to read on that. Um, I don't even know where to start reading the sources, but I imagine a YouTube search would be a good start, um, but Basically, all of the experienced uh, Soviet commanders um, at the higher ranking level, the ones who pioneered, you know, uh, building a large fleet of Soviet tanks, advancing the Soviet Air Force, uh, you know, organizing all these formations, um, 
even on a tactical scale, uh, uh, applying all these concepts of war, you know, basically all of them were 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 killed off, and so the the Soviet army um, at the start of Bar- uh, Operation Barbarossa was operationally completely unprepared because their their officers, even down to like lower ranking officers, were not um, were not conditioned to fight; they were conditioned to obey. And and the Red Army was not at a place yet where they, the the where they were able to like actually fully start training and and properly preparing their army. The the Red Army had these large projects, and what we saw at the start of Barbarossa was that this project was interrupted. Um, the Soviet the Soviet buildup was nowhere near completion, and it was such a large buildup that the Soviets would have needed another year in order to fully be ready. So chances are by 1942, the Red Army, probably at the earliest, but but by 1942, we would have seen a very different Red Army than what we saw historically. Uh, and a Red Army that probably would have been, in my opinion, on par, if not at the very least, better equipped than their German counterpart. Um, because even the German Wehrmacht, even by 1941, they were just not very well equipped. They were still a very infantry-heavy army. That, that that used horse-drawn artillery as their primary weapon of uh, the primary firepower when you really add it all up. But uh, they they had these elite Panzer Corps, they had this elite air force, and that's what allowed them to launch these stunning offensives across Europe. But the op- operations were usually um, they usually were logistically very costly for the German army, and they needed time to prepare. And the German industry showed that it was not able to keep up with the uh, rate of attrition that these operations had. And this is why we never saw another Operation Barbarossa in 1942. The German army had to consolidate its resources to a smaller scale operation, which, which was Case Blue, which which is smaller scale, I, which is odd to say because I'm pretty sure Case Blue was still larger than Case, Case Yellow. Or case white. I always confuse the two. I'm gonna to have to now do a Google search to look that up. But let's do that. Um, case, I believe, case white was the invasion of Poland. Yes. Excuse me. And then case yellow was the invasion of France or or the Low Countries during, um, you know, a battle of France. By the way, that's an operation. Yeah, basically, yeah, the Meinstein plan. This was, yeah, the Battle of France. I'm just want, I just want to say for the record that uh, the Battle of France is, I think, as equally interesting as a as a as a conflict as the uh, as the uh, Eastern Front of World War II. Um, but it was only six weeks, so it's just like a lot. It was very dense battle, um, very uh, very intense activity did happen along the front, but it only lasted six weeks, which is completely overshadowed by like the basically the four years of nonstop war we saw on the eastern front um and and i mean there were a few pauses here and there because of the mud season you know the rainy seasons or the spring thaw but other than that i mean this operation the eastern front was just active all the time so anyways that's what i hope to kind of show in this new sort of series i guess i'm going to make more of these i enjoy i enjoy this game enough to make more but the, the point I'm trying to make, I guess, for this video is to get you all kind of hyped up with, with the invasion of the Soviet Union. Realize that this is, this is very much an outlier invasion. So anyways, I'm going to stick to the f- East Front uh, setup for the Axis. I'm going to try to be pretty consistent, even with the names of the units. Um, you know, I could make a few changes here and there, but I really don't think there's a real need to, frankly. Um, I think the, the actual Axis setup was not bad. It was not bad, given the limitations they had in their army. Their army was very limited in actual operational capability, so they they kind of built an Operation Barbarossa accordingly. And I think that needs to be mentioned. So anyways, Army Group North has the 41st and the 56th Panzer Corps. That's what I'm focusing on right now. So i got to look for Army Group North somewhere. And where is that? It's somewhere here. That it was eventually deployed. Army Group Center, uh, I guess it was, there it is. Well, we just put it in Koenigsberg, and I said uh, 41st and 56th Panzer Corps, I believe. 
what I said. And again, yeah, so we're just gonna do that. Here it is, 41st, rotate it to full strength. There we go. I'm just making sure that's consistent. Yeah, 41st, 56. So it is gonna take a while for me to do the axis setup, but I, I'll start with a Panzer Corps just so I can give you guys a little insight as to what I mean by the German army group just was not as well equ as equipped as it could have been for this invasion. And, and this was a limitation, not on the part of the German army, although it was, but really it was a limitation on the German industry. Because in, in a way, the German army can only be so uh, so strong as, as, Ger as the German industry was able to build anything, let alone tanks and aircraft. And so we, next up, I got the 24th and the 39th Panzer Corps. 24th and 39th. I can't remember those two numbers. Here's the 24th. This is part of Army Group Center now. It's also the 39th Panzer Corps. Which um, hmm, should be here. Oh, there it is. Increases the full strength like so. 24th, 39th, I got those two down, right? 24th, 39th, I've got the 46th, 47th, 57th. There is, that's the 48th. Here's the 46th. And then I said 47th and 57th. Now the actual arrangement of these cores is a little random, frankly, especially when you look at the names. Um, also, given how like there was a, many German commanders, they were constantly being moved around. So um, it just I think just happened circumstance. But according to the according to this game, given the combat strength of these Panzer Corps, you can pretty presume that each uh, each combat value of the Panzer Corps is the equivalent of either a motorized division or a Panzer division. Um, basically, same thing, more or less. I mean, the formations were slightly different. The uh, motorized division had more uh, motorized infantry regiments, I believe, or uh, either that or there were battalions, while the panzer division had more battalions, and there's like a ratio between the two. Um, but the idea is is that the panzer divisions had more tanks. Um, the, the motorized infantry divisions, you know, as the name suggests, just had more motorized infantry. And keep in mind that these troops were just on trucks. They did not have many half tracks. That that scarcity of half half tracks in World War II is insane. They were less common than you would think, and so sometimes they were less common than actual tanks. And I got I got to double check the stats on that. But you know, um, in a nutshell, I mean, the majority of the of the motorization of the German army was dedicated to the actual combat units that that we have here, and so because they didn't have half tracks. Which I wish that could withstand machine gun fire often, and because of the nature of the Eastern Front and its long distances, often these uh, German columns would actually engage the enemy before the troops were actually deployed. You didn't want your troops marching around half the time because, again, the distances were so big between each objective. So you kind of had this like spaced out combat, which was at a tactical level different than what you saw in the Battle of France. And, and this confused the German army a lot. It even confused them during the, during the Battle of France. <clears throat> Excuse me. But what I'm trying to say is this is all my information that I know off the top of my head. And I think it's, some, it's somewhat accurate. I'm not going to say it's 100% accurate, but it's certainly more accurate than what, you, what you're hearing in, in other places. But the point I'm trying to make is that the developers, according to this stat, these units are all at full strength except for one Panzer Corps that seems to have some understrength units. But I don't know if this is a truly like an accurate way to actually look at it because I even heard that uh, a lot of German Panzer divisions, the you know, they just made more divisions but they redistributed the number of tanks. But then again, by 1941, the German army had a lot more pan uh, Panzer threes than they did in the Battle of France. The Battle of France was still relying predominantly on the Panzer II as their main tank. So, I mean, the, the German army, I, I would say was at its peak strength for the summer of 1941, really. They definitely were much stronger than they were for the Battle of France, but they were still not strong enough for the task that, that, they, that they had um, 
for them, which was conquer all of Russia, which was easier said than done. Army Group South, we've got um, four uh, groups. Uh, this group is technically a, a mechanized corps, which they didn't exist. Um, but you could think of it as a more infantry-heavy mechanized corps with more, uh, more of those uh, motorized infantry divisions and less of the panzer divisions. Um, so anyways, we've got the 3rd, 14th, and the 48th. 3rd, 14th, and the 48th Corps. So there's the 48th. Here's the 14th. This one is at full strength. And then we also have uh, one more, which was the 4th, I believe. Oh. I think it was also the 3rd. 3rd, 14th, and 48th, and then we also had the 55th mechanized group there. Like that, and I believe that was correct. Yep, there we go. So we've got all our mo mo mechanized motorized groups, and then I can tell you like how did the Germans actually classify these. They, they classified the one in the north um, as basically, I think they called them uh, panzer groups. And so the 56th and the 41st formed a panzer group. I believe it was the, I want to say it was the 4th panzer group. Then another panzer group formed, um, uh, Army Group Center had two of them. Um, I don't really know them off the top of my head, unfortunately, but I know that we got the 24th. I think it was the 46th and the 47th. I think this formed up a panzer group. This was the second panzer group under Guderian. And then I believe the 39th and the 57th combined formed the third panzer group under Hoth. Um, and this is all because of reading David Glantz sources. And then we had a th uh, the first panzer group here in the south, which, which according to this setup is, is a little bit meatier than the other ones. Um, but, you know, technically this here is motorized infantry, you know, that we're supporting. So this is a larger panzer group, but it's still... Um, you know, it's only one panzer group. And the problem the German army had was that they didn't have enough panzer groups because they were trying to encircle multiple sectors at once. Had they only concentrated along like one half of the sector, they would have been a lot more successful in their operations. But then that would have also meant that they would have only been able to attack only half of the Soviet army. And the, and the reality is that the Soviet army is so big or it, it, it spans such a vast swath of territory. So it would have been one thing if the German army... I mean, a good way to split it would have been the, the Pripyat Marshes. So you either can have this northern sector north of the Pripyat Marshes or the southern sector south of the Pripyat Marshes. And technically, the German army would have like four army groups. Army Group South had another shock group that, was, that included the Romanian army here in Romania. But the, the general takeaway is that they just didn't have enough panzers to uh, do the encirclements that they wanted. They succeeded in one area, which was the center. And they were able to encircle like a large cluster of Soviet armies. You can check out another video I have that talks about like which army was encircled there. But it was essentially just the 10th Army. The other army um, army HQs, I believe, survived or pulled out. But um, as you, as we will see in Operation Barbarossa, you know we're going to try to encircle as many Soviet armies as we can. But the reality is that the Panzer, the, the German army, is just not strong enough to actually encircle the Soviets. And, and, and when I say strong, they, at the very least, they just don't have enough motorized units. Uh, I'm pretty sure if the German infantry was to be fully motorized um, as the Panzer Corps were, if the German infantry corps were as motorized as the Panzer Corps, and, you know, we would have seen that in this game with uh, these units being able to move three hexes across rather than two, man, you would have seen, um, it would have been a lot easier for the German army to just chew up Soviet territory because they would have had these units, all their units would have been able to just glide across this territory no problem. Um, but unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you want to look at the war, um, these units, uh, certainly unfortunately playing as a war gamer here, playing as the Wehrmacht, but you're going to see that these units just are not able to encircle the Soviets as, as easily as you would think. These units a lot of the German infantry, all the German infantry are, are going to be able to only move two hexes across, meaning that they can only march. And so it is, it is a logistical uh, inconvenience, uh, as you'll see, for the German army. So we will enjoy, and that's the balance of the Eastern Front, really. 
you can see that the German army has so many operational advantages in the battles. That's pretty much unfair. Um, how how operationally um, advantageous the German army was in 1941, and it wasn't just the tanks and the aircraft. It was just the 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 concentration of manpower too at times. But as the invasion progresses, the the Germans are just not able to maintain that concentration of force while the Red Army, meanwhile, is able to sustain these atrociously high losses that are just abysmally high, but they're just enough for the Red Army to survive the war. And so, so I, really, I really am going to say that the Red Army is, is the superior army of the two, but nevertheless, we see a really good show by the German army. We see them fight. And, and really, Operation Barbarossa, I think, from every historical perspective, was the best odds of, of, the, of the Nazis conquering Eastern Europe. They really didn't have any other choice. And so um, what we saw was, I think, I think part of the reason why the fighting was so brutally intense on both sides is because both sides were completely committed to the war. If, if the, I think the Nazis really knew that if they lost this war, it would have been game over for them. And, and that's what ended up happening. And, and so they, they went down they went down fighting pretty brutally, and, and that's why World War II is such a brutal war, fundamentally. You know, so um, we don't have to worry too much about that when we play this game. We just are just moving blocks across the board, and we're just focusing on the military stats. But, but there's always, it's always, important, I think it's always important to remind everybody that there is a much deeper and darker conflict that was going on that wasn't just between the soldiers. It was between like the hearts and minds of the civilians, basically, and and, and then these government, these military governments that are, that are, that claim to represent the people, and you end up this was just, just this genocidal war, basically. So it's very interesting. These are very interesting aspects of World War II, I must say. But uh, we're just gonna carry on setting up this board here, um, and then set up these uh, German infantry corps. I think I've been talking enough, haven't I? Um, so yeah, let's do that. Uh, so we've got the Panzer Corps set up. Let's set up the infantry. Um, Army Group North has two armies. And I believe they were... I know that one of them was the 17th Army, I think. No, I'm, I'm, I'm already forgetting. It's okay. But we've got the 1st, 2nd, and 10th Corps. And we're going to look for those. Here's the 1st. Uh, these two, oddly enough, they were always in East Prussia. Interesting. First, second, and tenth, I said. There it is. First, second, tenth corps, 28th, the 26th. And then I also have one more core. 38th core. Where would that be? 38th core. Hmm. is man it does feel nice to be patient folks i will tell you so the 38th according to this is at full strength all the cores at full strength except for the 28th so another way to look at it with you know these stats um yeah the 26th should be at level four it's four divisions all at full strength then when you look at a level three stat, you can think of it as the equivalent of three divisions, or you can think of it as four divisions, but each of the divisions is at 75% of its combat strength. You can actually think of this number as an average of the combat strength of the divisions. It doesn't really matter how many. So level four would mean you've got your divisions at 100% combat strength. Level three means your divisions are now at 75% combat strength. Level two means you're at 25, or rather 50% combat strength. Level 1 means that you're at 25% of your combat strength, and you're basically at your breaking point. And so what's interesting is that the actual stats of your infantry corps, the actual number of troops, may not change dramatically. It's not necessarily in proportion to that percentage, but it's, a per in, per it's in proportion to the percentage of combat strength. And combat strength can probably be measured most accurately in a division when you're focusing on the actual amount of the readiness of your combat personnel. Because not all the com not all the personnel in a division are actually combat, and depending on which military we talk about, some nations have uh, an oversaturation of non-combat personnel, some more than others. I think a good example would be the U.S. Army divisions, 
that have a lot more non-combat personnel. They have a lot more administration. That's why they end up being more logistically, um, uh, more they, they consume more resources than other divisions do. Likewise, the Soviet divisions, the Russian divisions, consume less resources than the German divisions that we see in World War II. And so, you know, and that, that may explain part in part why the Soviet troops don't have as, as much helmets and, the, and they don't have as, as, as much food as, as their, their German counterparts. But it also explains why those Soviet units have an easier time um, operating in, in like harsh conditions like the Eastern Front, um, like, like the mud season or, or, or during the winter, perhaps. You know, tar, you know, there's all these moving, all these moving qualities to think about. But of course, in the large scale view of the war, we're not really thinking about that so much. We're really focusing on the health of our armies, and we just kind of simplify those all those complicated stats into just a single number. And that's what this number represents: this combat value. So, it's interesting because, you know, once we play a 1942 scenario, you're going to see that the bulk of the German army units on the Eastern Front are level three; they're not level four. And that all that means to me is that mu much of the German units or at 75% of their combat strength. And typically that's enough for defensive operations, but it's not enough for offensive operations. And so it's just an interesting stat to kind of compare to actual historical stats. And so I, I kind of have that, I kind of have that going on in the back of my mind, you know, because, you know, that's the power of data science, I think. And that's, you know, if you want to really be like magical about data science, you, you've got to be like kind of thinking like a little bit more scientifically about things. You want to be like just asking a lot of good questions pretty much. Questions that you can observe that can be can, that can be answered through through some sort of analyses or observation of data. Um, but as I move along here, we're going to do Army Group Center. Army Group Center, we have the uh, fifth, what is this, the fifth, um, fifth core, sixth core, Seventh core, eighth core, ninth core. So, just a lot of standard cores. Five through nine. I can look for those right now. Um, let's see. There's the fifth. There's the sixth. There's the ninth. I saw that the twelfth was also part of that too. See the eighth here, and here's the seventh. Boom. Just got a lot of them there taken care of. Um, yep. Sixth core taken care of already. I need the thirteenth, the twentieth, and the forty-third. 13th, there it is, the 20th, and the 43rd. Do, 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 where is the, uh, there's the 43rd, and then where is the 20th? Here it is. Another thing to point, uh, also just point out is that, um, I was going to make another point about these these German core. I actually don't think that all the German core are actually being showed right now. They're not. Um, only a few of them are. Most of them are, but there's a few that are actually missing in this in the setup. And I think same reasons as the Soviet side, although not as dramatic. But the idea is you just want to. You just want to uh, have um, ease ease of gameplay. And so some of the core are reduced, are removed altogether in the game. But right now, I think uh, I'm doing pretty well as far as getting this all set up. I just want to make sure that I have a few core that are under strength, like this 12th core here. But all these other German units are at full strength. So you can see the Germans did a pretty good job of making sure their armies are just nice and stacked up. Um, I don't like these ger these understrength German corps. They do begin to kind of add up after a while. They end up becoming a nuisance. Um, so I'm just going to kind of leave them in the rear, kind of as a rear guard. They can, they can act as a as a late tier reserve. But I want to make sure that all my strong infantry are moving up um, at the front line. That's just some that's like a little technique I learned from playing this game. After a while. So, and then as far as where I want to put the Panzer Corps, I mean, I'll put two there. That'll be like our Northern Wing Panzer Corps. Um, that's actually a really good place to put all my Panzer Corps, frankly. I'll put these two here, and then I'll just stack up the rest right there. And so now all my Panzer Corps are in range of attacking anywhere along the Army Group Center axes, which is really what I want. Um, which is important for the initial um, attack phase of Barbarossa. 
Only only units I'm missing right now is the German HQ, which I'll come back to. Let's do Army Group South now with the infantry. And I got a lot of um, infantry once again, a lot of troops. Uh, seven core this time. Last time I think I had nine core. Still a lot though. I think Army Group South, of all the Army Groups, to me is the one that impresses me the most. Uh, but then again, its objective is pretty daunting, which is to secure the whole Ukraine, right? From um, Soviet occupation. Liberate the Ukraine. I'm sure it would have been the uh, the Nazi propaganda, right? But at any rate, um, we're, I know that playing as a ram, like we're here to conquer the Soviet Union, okay? That's that's just the easiest way to put it. And I think the most accurate. So anyways, uh, 7 core. let's start with the 4th, the 17th. 29th so they're just all over the place in terms of their numbering here's the 17th though what else we have the uh, I saw the 49th this is a mounting unit interesting um, I saw I think I said the fourth right and what else we've got we need the 29th the 35th the 44th and the 52nd So I said 35th. I also said uh, 29th. Where would that be? Right here. I also said 44th, and I also said 52nd. Boom. Got them. All at full strength. Um, I think all the core, all but the 35th are at full strength for this in invasion, including the mountain core. Although, to be fair, we're not really fighting in much mountainous terrain. So the advantages of that unit are not really clear. But they're supposedly elite infantry. Um, but they just cost more. And then the 35th is the one that's under strength. But basically the equivalent of two more German armies. Infantry armies, rather. Three core per army. That I get to stack up over here. And then I'm just going to... Yeah, I'm just going to stack up this Panzer Corps... Panzer Army, rather, right here. And uh, we'll actually switch it up like that. Yeah, that seems reasonable. So, pretty good setup. Uh, pretty good setup. It's okay. I mean, Panzer Corps, though, are, are stationed right at the front. So, they are ready as ever. I'm actually going to switch up a couple like that. Yeah. Okay, so there we go. I will say, like, like once you have these these German units somewhat more distributed, you know, the advantages quickly disappear. It just doesn't become clear anymore. The uh, the German advantages, I think, in manpower, or at least in their in the concentration of their Panzer groups, you know, the the Panzer groups just seem they just feel so much more diluted now that they're located. Uh, basically distributed amongst all this infantry they just seem a lot less a lot a lot weaker they're just not as concentrated as you would think which i kind of find interesting and then um i gotta oh i gotta put the german hq somewhere just realized we'll put the german hq right there so I got one extra Panzer Corps, and I don't know where I want to put it. Because well, yeah, I'm just gonna stack up all my Panzer Corps there. Actually, it's the best place because they're in range of all these different objectives. Okay, that's an interesting setup, I must say. Um, but yeah, we're gonna just stick to that. So it's not 100% historically accurate. It's semi-historical setup, by the way. But we've finished setting up the German, all almost all the German units. We still have a few more, actually, that we have to set up in uh, in Romania. And there is a few extra units as part of uh, Army Group Romania. It's the 11th, the 30th, and the 54th Corps, making up another army. So I saw the 30th. I also need the 11th and the 54th. Here's the 54th. And then where is the 11th? 
somewhere here. There it is. Boom. And then um, the 30th is at full strength. Nice. All right. So, yeah, pretty much have the setup done here. You know, I have pretty much have main German army spaced up, spaced out in Romania. Uh, nothing really too special to see there. Um, but we do also have some Romanian units, and those units are going to be pretty interesting, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, we're going to increase the Romanian. These these cores, these these Romanian cores, are actually the equivalent of Romanian armies, and so the Romanian formations are just structured differently. And I just want to make sure I'm using the right ones. Yeah, we don't we don't want to use the allied ones. We want to use the axis markers so these are allied don't need those those are not axis these are the remaining units and I'm gonna just put them like that I think this guy's at level two and then um, yeah something like that I think is pretty reasonable for the Romanians I will put the fourth army over here in the swamps. Yeah, this the idea is we're able to just have a nice defensive line in case the Soviets try to go for police T. Police T, we don't want to lose police T at all. Not one bit. Bulgaria has also joined the Axis, I'm pretty sure. And so we'll set up their strength. Their units are pretty uh, pretty standard. Just some just one cadre. And I can double check. I have the uh I had the setup somewhere. So um, I probably should look for that. Somewhere here. Um, not there. Not there. Not me teaching me how to program. I think it's right here. Maybe I close it out. Um, yeah, I'm gonna have to look for it again. You will find manual. Here it is. Okay, got it. And uh, I'm going to the 1941 setup. right over here bingo if you're still if you're still watching this by the way I, I gotta say props to you and your patience because you know war games take a lot of setup I don't know what to tell you you know and I certainly take my time when I do so props to you if you're still here watching this video I gotta say I give you some credit there <coughs> but we can also as you can see in the setup that there are some static units to set up Eastern Front we're only setting up two units which are the remaining units um, but then I think on the Western Front, we are setting up, looks like, uh, two satellite units, total of level three. I know that one of them is probably going to be, uh, this, uh, Bulgarian unit. And then according to this, my static setup for my satellite units is located in the Western Front. Which is interesting. So that would that would tell me then that um hmm, that's very interesting. I would think there would be on the eastern front. But apparently this unit may be on like that, I guess. Um and then their C V should be a level one each. Like that. And then as far as the Western units, I know that one of them is at level one. What's the other unit though? Another unit at level two? I'm not sure what that unit would be. But I, I'm gonna go ahead and do the Italian setup and then set up uh, pretty much the Western front, Mediterranean front, all these other fronts. 
we have a lot more places to set up just a just a few more and then i think we've got the setup fully done um, but we'll start with uh the italians who really don't improve in strength all that much from the moment they enter the war but according to this we have uh, eight italian infantry one two three four five six seven eight Uh, I have nine in total. One of them is in the Mediterranean. Total of 12. I know that this is the one in the Mediterranean. All the other remaining Italian units are at level 12. Meaning, all these other units right now I count a total of 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So I need two more. And I believe they, they go all towards the 8th Army and increase the full strength. And that's that. That's that's what we have for the Italians. This guy is at level, looks like level 3 in the Mediterranean. I'm going to probably put him somewhere back there. We also have a mech unit in the Mediterranean as well. It's this guy here. And then I also have a static unit in Italy. I think I'm going to put him here actually. Yeah, and then all these other units, this guy is going to be sent back to the force pool, or dead pile. We also have an HQ in the Mediterranean. You have the CS is at level 2. Put this guy here in Tripoli. Maybe I'll we'll put him in Benghazi. And then all these other units are just like evenly distributed across Italy. Put some units in uh, their, wherever they're named after, like Sicily, SIC for Sicily, SAR for Sardinia. So those areas are pretty obvious. But the other areas that are not so obvious would probably be like Crete. Um, I definitely want Athens to be fortified. I don't want the British pulling off any sort of sneaky landing on Athens. Because Athens is like, if we lose As Athens, we lose um, there's a naval base in naval bases by the way are black and they basically control this this entire sea area and so there's like a there's a basically dice roll that you can use to stop enemy movement across this body of water so if the allies ever try to amphibiously invade any other location that they want the best target for them is going to be a port because then they can use the port as a supply source um, they they're gonna have to go through the sea and they're gonna have to deal with the the presence of the Italian Navy but if they somehow take Athens directly, then this entire basin is converted to a uh, allied naval base. And then they get to control the body water. They can then have all the supplies that they need. And so that's something to keep in mind when you're setting up a defense as the Axis. You don't really have to worry about it so much in 1941 because, you know, it's really just Britain all alone. And Britain just doesn't have, a, really they don't have that much offensive naval power. They don't have enough of that, and with a not with insufficient naval offensive power, they're going to struggle to um, really in, invade anywhere. And, and they don't even have uh, naval supremacy, which which can only be achieved once they control um, basically the Mediterranean uh, seaway. And the only way they can take that is if they control all the naval bases that that go around the seaway. That means they have to take Tunisia. They're going to have to take uh, Tripoli. Libya, they're going to have to take all these Axis naval bases first in North Africa before they can actually have that naval, that, that extra naval range. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, I'm going to leave this Italian 8th Army nearby. Um, probably going to leave it in Messina. Maybe we'll leave it in Reggio. The, the idea being that, you know, uh, we should be able to, I'm, I'm actually going to leave it in Cantania. But the idea is that if I ever needed to reinforce North Africa for some reason with an emergency Italian army, that I should be able to do so. And because the Axis control Tripoli and Benghazi, you know, the central Mediterranean Sea and the uh, Ionian Sea are going to be um, allied control. I, got, I still have to make a, a video directly dedicated to, to, to explaining the naval rules, and I, and I will at some point. 
Um, I definitely will now that I'm getting back into the game. <laughs> but that's basically the Italian setup. Um, and uh, the act, the minor axis setup. Uh, not too many minor axis units. I'm just interested. I'm interested that these two are on the western front. I think they would be technically on the eastern front, but um, uh, we'll we'll just leave it as as is for now. Um, I'm not really too worried about losing these naval bases. It's not a, it's not a serious problem. If the uh, if the Russians decide to amphibiously invade there. Um, but where else? What else do we have to do? Uh, the Italians, yeah, we did their static setup. Um, we're just missing a few more German units, I think, for the Western fed up setup. And then we also have to do the Northern Front as well. So we can go on and keep doing that. The German setup is, I think, a much more straightforward on the Western Front. At least in that pretty much all the units are under strength. Let's, uh, let's also throw in the Africa Corps. I know that this unit... It's going to be in North Africa already. I think I'm going to leave them here. The African, it's at level 2 only, which is kind of under strength, if you ask me. And then this Italian, or this uh, German HQ is also going to be at level 2 as well. We'll just stack them up there together. Yep, so four uh, CV points in total for the Axis in North Africa. So they have, a nice, they have a nice group of units, but unfortunately they're not strong enough to take to Brook. And they're not strong enough, I don't think, to attack uh, anything that the British have to the to the east. So they're kind of, and they're also in a vulnerable position right now. If the British decide to attack, they can easily break through. So that's something to keep in mind about the situation right now in the North African theater that I always find pretty interesting. Uh, the North African theater is a very strange one because of the logistics and everything's so expensive, and and the the battles are just so. Uh, they can go either way. It's insane. But um, let's continue on. Oh, here is the other static unit that was in the oh in the west. Interesting. Okay, so apparently all these uh, remaining units are going to be in the western front. And I'm thinking that can't possibly be right. But according to this, it's it's located on the western front including this other uh, Romanian army. But the problem is that I need all these uh, frontal axes occupied. And according to this, I just I just can't. Oh, you know, yes, I can. I still have one more German HQ unit. Here we go. This is at level one. Yeah. This guy will be... I'm going to leave him right there. Yep. Strange place to leave an HQ, but we're just going to... We're just going to go for it. And, and so this seems to be a pretty historical setup for the Romanians because these units were available. They were uh, part of the Romanian army, but they were not part of the first wave of this invasion of the Soviet Union. They just weren't uh, far from it. So, um, so yeah, just something to, I wanted to point out there. I think I'm actually going to just uh, swap these two guys out like that. Yeah. So we're going to do that. And then we should be able to attack in theory with practically all our units. I'll, I, I'll even swap out these two guys. Like so. I have a reason for that, as we'll see later on. But I think this video, this video is so long that we, this is the setup is plenty enough, plenty long enough for this video, I think. Don't you think? I think so. But um, yeah, we're just going to go ahead and finish up with the Western Front setup. And the takeaway is that just pretty much all the remaining German units are just thrown in here. And they're just an odd, they're an odd bunch. Um, but the key focus is to look at the common value. It's eight infantry. And they have a total of 12 points altogether. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to bunch up just simply the uh, German infantry. The standard infantry, none of the special units, none of the uh, veteran units, just the uh, good old-fashioned infantry. None of the mech units or army units or militia. And make sure I ha should have eight, and I do. I count eight. And then, of course, they're all at level total of level 12. So I can do some basic math there. And basically, all my units 
should be at level two strength. And um, actually, no. I, if they were all level two strength, that would be a total of 16 combat value. And instead, I only have eight. Oh, I have 12 combat value. So, yikes. These units are all going to be at level one, actually. And then, and then four of which can be at level two. And that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, so that's a total of 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 12 combat value right there. And these units are going to be the ones distributed all over Western France, the low countries. This is the so-called Atlantic Wall. But it really is, it's barely a wall. I mean, barely one division per uh, hex side. And by the way, a hex side is about um, the, the, the width of a hex. Uh, diagonally ac across is about uh, I think a hundred um, kilometers so, so a hex side is about 50 kilometers in length that's equivalent to about 30 miles in length uh, I believe that's what it is I can double check right now maybe I should go on uh, Google Maps here and just I'm just let's just go to like France right now go to uh, Now let's go to France here. And um, yeah, I'll just try to look at the dimensions. And I would say, I mean, that's that's in the ballpark. Yeah, I would say it's about 30, km, 30 miles. Let's zoom out. Yeah, I'd say, or it should be, yeah. About 30 miles. I would think so. So, yeah, that, that, that confirms that. Um, but then let's also assemble all the other units, too. There's there's a few other unit types to keep in mind. We have units like our fortress uh, units, right? These fortified units, they are... I can show you. We have three forces units, and they're all level one each. But they're they're special in that they have triple fire defense. That was that's what makes them so special. I guess they're not available until 1941. No, I should have one more unit, one more fortress unit nearby somewhere. Oh, I think it's right here. Yeah, so these guys have triple fire. So I'm probably gonna set up these guys first. We'll put them in the in the most obvious places. I think uh, I think those areas are pretty reasonable. Yeah, I'm gonna fortify Cherbourg. And then we'll put up uh, these guys here. Denmark unit obviously goes in Denmark. And then, I don't know, some of these other units, like, I don't want them all over the place too much. Um, still a few more units to set up. We have the uh, militia units for the Germans. These include the satellite units, or, or the static units. We only have two. And, and only only one cadre between them both. I'm going to actually make it... A, the Danish units. Put it in Copenhagen there. Yeah. And so yeah, this is it. This is like the entire German defense. I think we also have a mech unit, don't we? Yeah, we have uh I guess these mech units though are located in the Mediterranean. Yeah, they're all located in the Mediterranean or the Balkans, is what I was saying. And they, Italy or the Balkans. So they were part of the invasion group that was used to invade Yugoslavia and Greece in 19, uh, 1941. That's when those campaigns happened. Right before Operation Barbarossa, pretty much. And so, yeah, I can put these units anywhere in the Balkans. I think Hungary is considered as part of the Balkans, actually. But I guess they are they are still cooperating. So I guess I'm just gonna leave them 
I'm just gonna leave him in Yugoslavia for now. I'll just leave him in Belgrade. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And, oh, it looks like two of the German units are also in the Balkans. So I guess I'm going to transfer the two, two strongest German infantry and have them move over to the Balkans, basically. And my, my only takeaway from all this is that I still need a unit in Brest. And that's what I want to change right now. But yeah, I mean, the, the German setup is really weak right now in the Western Front. Super weak. Like, super duper weak. By far, like, the weakest setup I think I've ever seen. So weak, in fact, that I'm willing to lose Traborg. That's how weak it is. And yeah, we're just going to have to make do with, with, uh, with the setup that we have here. Because... Yeah, the axes are just not in a strong position right now in the West. So they're very vulnerable to British uh, invasion right now. Extremely vulnerable. I mean, the British could, could at least steal a port from the axis, which I find to be pretty interesting. But anyways, these two units are going to be in the Mediterranean. I guess I'm going to leave these units in Bulgaria. Not sure where else to put them. Either Italy or the Balkans. Yeah, these are the, the units that didn't make it to uh, to Operation Barossa in time. But the idea is that we have units that are nearby, and and I guess given the given the way they're positioned, they're going to be units that can support uh, the invasion of uh, the Ukraine, or Ukraine, Ukraine, depending on, on. I call it the Ukraine, speaking as a military historian, but nowadays it would it would be better if I called it Ukraine, right? But anyways, uh, by the way, the only reason why we would invade the U Ukraine is to go for the Donetsk Industrial Basin. It's the only objective. It's, only, it's the only reason why we would take Ukraine is to go for Eastern Ukraine, right? Western Ukraine, not, at least according to this game, not nearly as important. Um, and then likewise, I'm, I'm going to talk about this in the next video when we actually start the invasion. Just what, 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 were the, what was the objectives that the German army was even thinking about? But uh, for this for this video, we're doing the setup, and I think we're pretty much done. The only thing left to set up is going to be the northern force, and you can see here we have we have several units. So we can't under, underestimate the German presence of units in Scandinavia. They had a lot, um, but starting with the HQ, named after some person. We have, uh, what else? Uh, lots of infantry. We have these mountain units that are stationed in the north. They're going to be our flagship invasion group if we decide to attack uh, Murmansk, which is a interesting strategic objective to take in the north. I think we're going to go for it, but it's a gamble. There's no chances of a success there. Um, but then we also have some more infantry. Two infantry at a total of combat strength of two altogether. And then we also have some static units. Total of five combat value, it looks like. So two at full strength. And then one at level one. And most of these units are going to be deployed to defend Norway. And we just want to put them in these fortified locations. And then, you know, we want to control the black ports predominantly because that's going to control the body of water. So that's just kind of what, what we're thinking. Um, and then we can put these units here. I think that's pretty good. We have access to the rail lines here. And we really want to have access to rail lines when we're moving 
making a bunch of moves. Uh, and, and setting up our invasion of Murmansk. And then I got one more uh, army here. Slightly extra army. Uh, not too worried about uh, losing these other ports. My main focus is making sure we don't lose. So yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll double stack our units there. The, the main thing is to just make sure that we don't lose the, the really important bases. That's what we don't want to lose. Having them double stacked, I think, pretty much guarantees that they're not lost. And of course, the British can land and they can take a port, but if they don't control this body of water, they're going to be subject to um, losing supplies. And that's, that is going to be a nuisance for the British. So um, I don't mind them invading and then trying to do a, a ground invasion because by that point, you know, I'll be able to respond. And then I, we also have a paratrooper in the Western Front as well. So I have one extra ground unit, which is which is convenient, I must say. That is helpful. To even have just that one extra ground unit that I can place somewhere. Um, I would rather put it super close to to uh, to London, as close as I can, really. And then we also have HQs. A few German HQs in the Western Front, but they're uh, all going to be under strength. They're all going to be under strength. Um, yeah. Uh, so we only have two common value for the Western Front, so that's going to be OKH or OKW rather. That's going to be a level two. But I also have a Army Group E and an Army Group G, but both of these um, are at level zero, so they're just. They're just not what they need to be right now in order to provide any substantial defense of France. Skeletal crew, really. But at least we have something in the sector. Uh, but we really don't have that much in, in, the, in the wake of, of actual ground troops right now. Um, but we at least have enough to defend against a British landing, any sneaky landing somewhere. It's going to be hard for them. You know, even if they... Uh, you know, it's going to be hard for them to, like, actually, like, affect the, the whole front. But they, they could be a nuisance. And um, I think that's going to be it. That's pretty much the uh, German setup for the Western Front, Eastern Front, Mediterranean Theater. And you can see that most of our units are primed to the Eastern Front, even in the Northern Front. Um, but we still have some more reinforcements to bring up. I'm excited for Operation Barbarossa. I think this, hopefully, this setup... Just goes to show you that, well, although, yes, the Red Army was a large army, um, and technically it was the larger two armies on the Eastern Front, when you look at all of Europe, I mean, the German Wehrmacht was pretty sure consistently the largest army of World War II for quite a long time. I think the Japanese army may have been bigger, but at least in the European theater, the, the Wehrmacht remained as, as the largest army in Europe. And as you, as you saw, this setup took a long time. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind, you know, and, and also another thing to point out is at least this game is suggesting to us that the German army has pretty much stacked up as many divisions as they could for Operation Barbarossa. Yes, they have a few more units in the West that they could have mobilized, but these units are like completely at Kaja strength. They are they're completely under strength. None of them, not a single one of them is uh, combat ready. Perhaps a few in Norway are combat ready. Right, but that's it. That's all we've got. Every other unit that we have out here is uh, not primed and ready for uh, for some sort of combat operation. They're just in a bad setup. So I find that I find that super interesting. Um, how uh, the developers were able to reflect just how you know the most much of the German army is is still quite large, but most of them are just 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 a, a, a bare bone reserve they really did what they could to assemble as many troops as they could i mean this is as strong as it gets i mean you have so many four stacked units a few three stacked um about maybe a quarter of them are, are level threes right but 
still, I mean, most of the German units, most of the Axis units are at full strength. Most, not all. Now, that, and that to me is really fascinating. And then, of course, you know, you can look at the Italians. They're not in much better sh uh, shape either. Um, so the Axis just don't really have, a, have much of a reserve to, to really deal with. Uh, they would have needed more time to build up the reserves, and of course that would have given the Allies more time to build up. So there's a reason why Adolf Hitler decided to attack in 1941 and, and not wait a, another moment. And, and chances are if they did, the Soviets would have had a much better defense. Um, still, the, the odds of actually defeating the Soviet Union are hard because despite this massive German buildup, I mean, look how big the Soviet Union is. I mean, this game really shows it to you. I mean, if they're trying to conquer the whole entire thing, no way. Right? Just no way. I mean, even trying to get to Stalingrad. I don't know what, what our goal is going to be. Um, I know that we're going to try to do our best to cause as much damage and destruction on the Soviet Union. That's pretty much the main goal. Um, but uh, I do want to take Leningrad. I want to take everything. But we'll, we'll see how the war goes. How the war goes. I know that Germany can only go so far. And so with that, we're going to stop the video here. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. I definitely enjoyed making this video. And uh, stay tuned for more as I do another Let's Play. And then we actually can start Operation Barbarossa and, and actually see how the operation takes place. And then, um, you know, if you haven't, if you want to know more about this game, you know, ch check out my other tutorials that I have on the channel. Um, they're in there somewhere. you got to, you know, look for them, but they're there. And um, this is a great game. It's, it's one that I really recommend. Um, but but there is a learning curve. You're gonna have to go through this rule book, and so you know you can let me know below. You know if you if you want to see like um, an open source like uh, you know kind of like a a game that you don't have to actually know the rules, but like everything is already algorithmically algorithmically set up for you. Let me know because that is that is a project that I'm working on right now is is trying to uh, program this a game like this. Um, but JavaScript is one hard software to learn, um, but I'm learning it day by day. So um, with that, thank you for tuning in, and um, I'll see you in the next video. Peace out.